Narcissism is one of the most studied personality disorders of the modern age. Now, before we dive into the top 10 royal narcissists, I have to make something clear. Narcissism is a product of our society and time, meaning that we may misdiagnose certain historical figures when we come to see them as narcissists. Nonetheless, there are several people in history who are almost certainly narcissists, such as Henry VIII. And as such, I feel credible in using this term for particular historical figures. Bizarrely, many modern day royals too are likely sufferers from this personality disorder. Yet many spectators don't even realize just how damaging some of their actions are. In this video, I will be explaining my qualifiers for narcissism and provide a general definition for the term before then applying it to certain modern day royals and historical figures. And of course, an important disclaimer is needed for this topic. Because narcissism is a controversial topic and many people would believe it to fulfill defamation, I need to explicitly state that I am not disparaging anyone mentioned in this video. Rather, I'm suggesting that people mentioned show traits that could suggest patterns of narcissistic behavior. But before we begin, we must first ask the question, what is a narcissist? Let's break down the definition of narcissism before we finally apply these to the modern day royals and historical figures. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, narcissism is a personality disorder in which the afflicted has an excessive and inflated sense of self. Now, this definition alone can apply to thousands, if not millions, of people, especially those who are royal. However, specialist research on narcissism provides specific qualifiers and traits that a narcissist may have. This video has access to the insight of royal courtier and author, Lady Colin Campbell, whose book, Daughter of Narcissus, provides a fresh insight on how to detect traits of narcissism. These factors include self-esteem issues and exaggeration of achievement, compulsive and complex lying, tendency to value people only if they serve a purpose, and lastly, high sexual slash careless appetite. And now let's finally get into the top 10 most royal narcissists, going from the least likely to the most likely. Number 10, Cece, Empress Elizabeth of Austria. Now, this is probably going to come as a surprise knowing that there's a drama at the moment called Die Kaiserin and it's quite popular. In this drama, Cece is depicted as a wild child, certainly not a narcissist, but someone unwilling to sacrifice her independence in a restrictive and confining Austrian court. In reality, however, Cece's behaviours can point to several qualifiers of narcissism, the most profound indicator of narcissism in Cece is her obsession with her beauty. One of the reasons why Cece refused to be pregnant more than four times was because she wanted to maintain her waistline, which was only 16 inches. She had her final child in 1867, although this was a political concession to Hungary, rather than a performance of royal duty. Shortly after this birth, she banned photographs from being taken of her demanding people to think of her only in the prime of her youth. This fulfills the lacking self-esteem indicator of narcissism. Another factor speaks to the terrible relationship Cece had with her other daughter. She forced her daughter, Gisela, to marry her own cousin at the age of 16, despite Cece experiencing the same and detesting having done so. She reportedly disliked her daughter because, unlike her, her daughter was not a beauty and was quite serious in nature. It's a note that she didn't fulfil Cece's purpose to complement her mother's beauty. However, I have placed Cece at the top of this list because it's actually very unlikely that she suffered from narcissism. Instead, she likely suffered from a mental health rather than a personality disorder. Her obsession with beauty is likely due to a control factor, as she found her appearance the only thing she could truly influence in her life. Her terrible relationship with her daughter was more the result of being unable to raise her due to her mother-in-law's interference. In totality, we can see that Cece is unlikely to be a narcissist when we take into account her mental health. Number nine, Princess Michael of Kent. So this is a modern day royal that people back in the day are more likely to know about and she was very controversial. <laughs> Following Meghan Markle's arrival into the British royal family, there have been some more recent shocking reports which risk narcissism on the part of Princess Michael. 
So, Princess Michael of Kent is married to the Duke of Kent, who was the Queen's cousin. Princess Michael has caused quite a lot of controversy, to say the least. Her father was a Nazi party member, and many have recorded that these fascist ideals influenced the princess in her formative years. Now, being a Nazi in itself is not a qualifier for narcissism, yet there are some similarities which we will unpack. In 2004, in New York City, the princess caused controversy when she demanded that a black waiter serve her before the other patrons in a restaurant. When he explained to her why he couldn't, she told him, quote, verbatim, go back to the colonies. She also minimised Prince Harry wearing a swastika during a fancy dress party, stating that people needed to focus on their own bloodline. What? She also named a pair of black sheep after Venus and Serena Williams. And finally, upon meeting Meghan Markle, she opted to wear a necklace depicting a slave woman in front of her. So how does this make her a narcissist? Interestingly, her attacks seem launched more so on other women than men, if we exclude the waiter incident. Additionally, her grandeur and self-righteousness alerted the Queen, who claimed that she seemed more grander than anyone else in the royal family. Now, I would define the princess as a possible narcissist, because she seems very insecure about her position as a minor royal, and she cannot stand how contemporary society is egalitarian racially and economically. Number eight, King Juan Carlos of Spain. Unfortunately, being royal gets into the heads of many men. Prince Albert of Monaco, for example, dubbed the Playboy Prince, is one of them. But he doesn't hold a torch when it comes to King Juan Carlos of Spain. Unlike his dutiful wife, Sophia of Greece, the former King of Spain cared more for pleasure than his royal affairs, and conducted his own. In fact, he is reported to have had over 1,500 lovers throughout his lifetime, which is extreme. Juan Carlos can be regarded by some as a narcissist, for the simple reason of his compulsive lying. His wife, Queen Sophia, caught him in the act on one occasion after he denied having affairs. More recently, he was exiled from Spain after the authorities reported that his activities may suggest embezzlement. So, in totality, he fulfills two areas of possible narcissistic behavior, a high sex drive and compulsive lying. Number seven, Edward VIII of England. So this is a figure in history and more recent royal family that I feel pertinent to make this list. Although he probably had another form of personality disorder, nonetheless, he does have symptoms that can be considered possible narcissistic behavior. If we look at this couple 20 years ago with the title of narcissist, 99% of you would view this person, Wallace Simpson, as the guilty party. However, it is now more likely that her husband demonstrated this sort of behavior. Let me explain. Edward VIII conducted many affairs in his youth, which fulfills one measurement for potential narcissistic behavior. However, once Wallace Simpson entered the picture, other events occurred which reinforce evidence of this personality disorder. Wallace Simpson, once Edward was king, tried to leave him, mostly because of how unpopular she was in England. Many at the time viewed her as the reason why the king abdicated, but in reality, it was his own temperament and actions which guided this decision. When Wallace tried to leave Edward, he threatened suicide if she did so. Clearly, his manipulation had no bounds. Once the two were married, and Edward's brother, King George VI, was on the throne, his self-aggrandizement stretched even further. Before the Second World War, Edward and Wallace met with Adolf Hitler, who conducted a plan to dispose of the British royal family if they managed to invade successfully. In their place, Hitler would appoint Edward as a viceroy, while his own brother and nieces, the princesses Elizabeth and Margaret, would have been imprisoned for life, or worse, shot to death. These events were not known to the British public for many years, but once they were revealed, the public completely lost confidence in Edward VIII's claim to the throne and rallied around Elizabeth II. Overall, many have tried to diagnose Edward with a personality disorder, including narcissism. It's probable that he had a disorder, given his alignment with Nazi ideology, simply to reclaim his crown while remaining with his obsessive love. Number six, Princess Margaret. This is perhaps a unpopular decision on my part, but please hear me out. Princess Margaret displayed several factors of potential narcissistic behavior. Although she certainly was not born with these traits, 
her life and experiences slowly would create a personality of self-obsession, lacking self-confidence and sexual misconduct. Let's explain further. When Margaret was in her late teens, she started a relationship with group captain Peter Townsend, who she was barred from marrying, or would have to cede her succession rights and her status as a royal highness. She simply safeguarded her position at the expense of love, although this was a very tough decision. By the time she married her husband, Tony Armstrong Jones, Margaret's mental health was already facing a toll. She was likely suffering from alcoholism and substance abuse, and her husband, a committed hedonist, did nothing to prevent it from escalating. Within a few years, Margaret and her husband's relationship had broken down, and both were conducting affairs. Margaret wanted to reconcile with her husband, but he largely dismissed her, and only gave her attention when he was invited to rule functions. Now, Tony really is more of a narcissist than Princess Margaret. However, he is excluded from this list because he never received a royal status. In summary, Princess Margaret is an interesting case study into how potential narcissistic personality can be created due to royal pressures. The fact that she was always number two in comparison to her sister meant that her self-confidence was always strained. She eventually lied about her behaviour later in her life and was critical about other people's misconduct, notably towards Princess Diana. She also, with the pressures of her husband, sought solace in extramarital conduct. These factors fulfil indicators of narcissism. Remember, since we cannot successfully diagnose her, we cannot decisively claim that Princess Margaret was a narcissist. Instead, we can claim that she displayed qualities which are similar to the personality disorder. Number five, Elizabeth Louise, the Duchess of Barry. Louise is one of the four people mentioned on this list who are not a modern day royal, yet her behavior in 18th century France means that she certainly deserves a spot on this ranking. Now, many people have claimed that Elizabeth Louise was a victim and that somehow this status means that we cannot criticize her bad behavior. Elizabeth Louise was indeed a victim of abuse, but because of this, she chose to perform crappy behavior which fulfilled many factors of narcissistic personality. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the abuse that she suffered before I connect this to her borderline narcissistic personality. When Louise Elizabeth was only 14, she suffered from a terrible childbirth, giving birth to a stillborn daughter. While she was in recovery, her father, who was a sex addict, likely sexually violated her. And this relationship continued until Elizabeth Louise passed away 10 years later. Although she was a victim of her father's control, she displayed terrible behaviour owing to a fact that she had a very low self-esteem. Her grandmother wrote that, at the age of 17, Elizabeth Louise threatened to murder her husband because he started an affair with a chambermaid. However, Elizabeth Louise was a hypocrite since she was already having an affair with two guards at the palace. Once her husband died in a mysterious hunting accident, she became a merry widow and fell pregnant five times in four years from various men, including her own father. In April 1719, she almost died giving birth to a stillborn child, and when doctors advised her to rest for the next month, she refused and instead took back multiple lovers. It needs to be said here that Elizabeth Louise, like her father, abused her royal position to procure sexual pleasure and would often threaten her sexual partners with exposure if they refused to cooperate. The mind of a manipulator through and through. People who defend Elizabeth Louise are quick to point out that she suffered abuse from her father, yet conveniently forget to mention how the princess would manipulate others for the same gratification. Most egregious of all, however, is the fact that she even admitted to her own grandmother in 1718, when she asked about her affairs, that she was too prideful to ever listen to what people were telling her to do. She was almost certainly a narcissist, but at least Elizabeth Louise was self-aware. Number four, Louis XIV of France. It would be impossible to talk about raw narcissism without talking about Louis XIV. After all, he thought of himself as a sun king, a demigod on earth who deserved everyone's supreme attention. Louis was the grandfather of the hedonistic Elizabeth Louise, and alike his granddaughter, Louis conducted many affairs, even going as far as to blame them when things started to go wrong. For example, when Louis tired of his first mistress, Louise, he initially refused to let her leave the palace because he couldn't imagine her with anyone else. 
His next mistress, Madame de Montespan, was regarded as the most beautiful woman in France, yet he could not stand anyone who claimed that she was more attractive than he. If a courtier did so, they were forced to leave Versailles. By the time Montespan approached her 40s, Louis got bored once again and took a new mistress, the 18-year-old daughter of one of his ministers. When she fell pregnant within a few months, Louis no longer found her attractive. When she went into labour and almost died, he refused to visit her and instead banished her to a church. Of course, we cannot talk about Louis without talking about Versailles. This palace is a literal embodiment of narcissism. Each room was adorned with motifs of Louis's face or paintings depicting him, meaning it was impossible to visit the palace without having to see representations of the king. Overall, Louis completely fulfills three of the four qualifiers for narcissism, an inflated sense of self-confidence, high sex drive, and a tendency to value people only if they pleasured him. Number three, Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex. Meghan Markle is like Marmite. People either love her, believing her to be the bastion of truth and contrary to discrimination, or if you're like me, you see how she displays self-aggrandizing behavior at the expense of others. So this is going to be quite a lengthy explanation, so I'd suggest that you get a drink or a snack because there's a lot to unpack. <laughs> when Meghan got engaged to Prince Harry, Britain rejoiced as they witnessed the couple as a microcosm of modern Britain, where different racial and cultural backgrounds can come together. Meghan was also one of the most beautiful people to join the royal family. She was compared alongside Diana, Princess of Wales, and even Grace of Monaco. However, once they were married, cracks in Meghan's personality began to show pretty quickly. Reports from Buckingham and Kensington Palace spoke of royal staff members who were terrified of having to work for the Duchess, calling her to be a bully and incredibly demanding. By the time Meghan and Harry announced their exit from being working members of the royal family, they took an interview with Oprah where things reached boiling point, including many evidences for potential narcissistic personality. For example, Meghan claimed that her son, Archie, was unable to receive the title of prince or receive protection. Following these comments up with claims that someone in the royal family wanted what the baby's skin colour would be once he was born. When Oprah asked whether the two were related, Meghan conveniently missed out an important fact. The fact that Archie was not given a princely title because he was not a grandchild of Queen Elizabeth and since he was not in direct line to inherit, he was not allowed to be given a princely rank. Because Meghan did not mention how royal succession works, Oprah believed that Archie was not a prince because of his skin colour, which is completely inaccurate. After the interview, many have noted that Meghan has exploited her position as a non-working royal to seek deals with major corporations. Although she has, arguably, every right to do so, issues arise when we look at how she and Harry happen to do it. Her interview with Vogue is very interesting, knowing that it's very much centred on her, not her husband or even her children. She even recalled a comment from someone in South Africa who claimed that her joining the royal family was like Nelson Mandela leaving prison. This comparison is utterly self-aggrandizing. Finally, the Duchess of Sussex has been exposed as using people only to fulfill a short-term purpose. Piers Morgan, who was once a friend of Meghan, was completely rejected once she became engaged to Prince Harry. Oprah, who hadn't even met Meghan, was invited to her wedding, while Meghan's father was banned from the wedding and has not had communication with her or even his own grandchildren. Meghan even divorced her ex-husband without telling him beforehand and merely put her wedding ring through the door. As professionals claim, sharply cutting someone out of your life without any explanation to the other person is potentially indicative of narcissistic personality disorder. When we approach the main qualifiers for narcissistic traits, we can see how there might be parallels with the Duchess of Sussex, including lacking self-confidence, valuing people if they only serve a purpose, and compulsive lying. Now, don't get me wrong, Meghan's concerns about racism in Britain are deeply distressing. However, we shouldn't use this as an excuse to dismiss or even minimise Meghan's bullying of royal staff members many of whom are from disadvantaged backgrounds and have had their voice silenced. Considering that Meghan has advocated for truth, allowing women to come forward and express their oppression, 
It's a hard pill to swallow knowing that Megan has prevented women from doing exactly this. Megan's actions may indicate narcissism, but it's important for me to say, once again, that I am not outright calling her a narcissist. Number two, Sultan Ibrahim of the Ottoman Empire. And now we enter the territory where possible narcissism has terrible, terrible consequences. Unlike everyone else mentioned on this list, the number two and one spots are for people who are almost certainly are narcissists and their actions are seriously damaging. Sultan Ibrahim of the Ottoman Empire has long been criticised as being insane. He had a terrible childhood as he was forced to grow up in a cage and away from any loving environment. By the time he became Sultan, his demands for self-aggrandizement intensified. He even wanted to have his private rooms decorated in the most expensive materials available on earth, because according to him, this was the bare minimum for what he deserved. He also had sexual access to over 200 teenage girls who were confined to a harem. Unlike other sultans who would violate these women sexually, Ibrahim did far, far worse. He murdered them. One of his concubines started a relationship with one of the guards of the harem, because the guard was a eunuch, nothing inappropriate could happen, yet Ibrahim went crazy, believing all the girls were showing displeasure towards him. Over days, he organised to have 280 women tied with heavy objects to their feet and then thrown into the sea to drown. Sultan Ibrahim represents the darker side of possible narcissism, as his self-confidence was so dire, he was willing to murder anyone who sought affection away from him. And now moving on to the biggest royal narcissist of all time. Number one, Henry VIII of England. Surely I do not need to explain why Henry VIII is a narcissist. It's pretty obvious if you know the history. Nonetheless, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to break down each of the possible factors of narcissism and explain explicitly how Henry VIII fulfills them. When approaching self-esteem, we can see how Henry VIII's childhood sparked these issues. For example, until the age of 11, Henry was the second son and was prepared for a clergyman career, which he didn't want because he enjoyed sensual pleasures far too much. When his mother died when he was only 12, he found that he lost a much needed attention from a female figure in his life. It's possible that he was attracted to Catherine of Aragon because he valued her maternal instinct and fell in love with her because of it. Henry also committed countless lies over the course of his reign and even that is an understatement. During the Pilgrimage of Grace uprising, he promised that he would not punish those involved and would recognise their commitment to Catholicism. Instead, months later, he massacred those who were involved and refused to cooperate with the Pope. His lying stretched to foreign policy as well, since he promised France that he would not invade, only to do so and take Boulogne through conquest. Nice move, Henry. And now we move on to the most profound indicators of narcissism that Henry committed, high sexual appetite and the tendency to throw people off when they've lost their purpose. Since Henry married six times, two ending in divorce and another two ending with literal execution, it's perfectly clear that he did so. While married to Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn and Anne of Cleves, he also committed numerous extramarital affairs, demonstrating his high sex drive and deception. Many believe that Henry VIII's sexual conquests are the reason he died from syphilis, although this is not conclusive. And there we have it, the top 10 royals who are most likely narcissists. I hope you enjoyed this video because I certainly enjoyed doing the research for it. And as always, my name is the Shy Historian and stay tuned for many more.